Good morning, church. Good to see you. Happy Sunday. All right, I'm going to see how awake you are. I'm going to put on the screen here in just a second, don't do it yet, an image. It's going to be a famous image. It might be from a movie you've recognized. If you know the name of the movie, I need you to shout out the title of the movie, okay? We're only going to do one, one shot, so be ready. Get your thinking caps on. You ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Lord of the Rings. All right, who knew that? Okay, okay, very good, impressive. If you have watched Lord of the Rings, then no doubt you know that there is a friendship between these two guys right here, between Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee. And these guys are basically inseparable because they've chosen to have a fellowship, a bond with each other that runs deeper than just, hey, how you doing, buddy? It is a deep and a lasting fellowship that is rarely seen in movies or in real life. And it is so powerful, and it is beautiful. There is this ease that they have with each other, this deep and profound, lasting friendship. And as I look at this, I, was, I thought, you know what? We're not going to call this the Fellowship of the Ring because it has nothing to do with the ring today. It has everything to do with the king, the Fellowship of the King of Kings, who came and offered, get this, friendship with us. Not like friendship like you and I pat each other on the back like a buddy from out of town. A holy friendship that is incredible and is so amazing. And as you look at scripture, of all the people in Jesus' inner circle, there is one couple that seem to have a unique and a beautiful bond with him, a friendship that is so close with Jesus. He's even called the disciple whom Jesus loved, the beloved, and that's John. John seems to have this unique and close fellowship with the Lord that honestly I find fascinating and I emulate. And I think it's just so, so amazing because this is the same John who not long before he met Jesus was just this young buck, this happy-go-lucky kind of Galilean fisherman. It was really young. He's like, we we're fishing, we're having a good time. And then suddenly Jesus shows up and he changed everything. He says, come on, follow me. Bring James. You know Peter? Bring Peter. It's cool. We'll come together. And and, and this guy goes from being this happy-go-lucky, light-hearted fisherman to suddenly being in the core, inner key sanctum, top three of Jesus' disciples, of his core followers. How does that happen? This is the one whom, in all the paintings and in the scriptures, you see what inspired it. John is the one seen reclining at the Last Supper in the upper room against Jesus' chest. John is the one who is is kneeling at the cross. When Jesus is there and he's with Mary and he says, this is your family. When all the other ones had, had pretty much run off, John remained. What was the secret to his fellowship with the king? What was it? He reveals it. And it is so amazing because it's a verse I claim often, but it's a verse that we've read often. We've never studied it together as a church, but it is so powerful. I think we gloss over it. I think we read through it. We go, oh yeah, First John, that's pretty cool. I want to set the context for what we're about to read. We're not going to read the Gospel of John. We're going to read the first epistle of John, okay? If you're new to the faith, or maybe you're a recent believer, or or you're just checking things out, this is towards the back of the book, right before Revelation. You want to go ahead and pull that up, but hold your place there, because I want to set the context. John is writing to believers at this point. He's not writing to seekers or lost people. He's writing to believers, and he is saying, you can know this king. You can have this incredible fellowship. In fact, he says it 30 times in these five short chapters. 30 times he says, no, you can know. You need to know. No, no, no. Not N-O, K-N-O-W. Did I spell that right? K- okay, K-N-O-W. That's what he's saying. Not that you can hope or you can guess or you can pray or you can wonder or you can surmise. He says you can know. You can have this fellowship with the king that will sustain you through the storms. And it's incredible, and he's really passionate about this. So turn with me there. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 5. And while you pull that up, let me welcome those online today, our online campus that's streaming with us. We have a couple dozen fishermen who are at the beach on their way home. It is good to have you guys. I hope you're watching this. We're checking. We're taking roll. Okay. Everybody got it? Look with me at verse 5, and it says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have, what's that word? Fellowship with one another. 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Whew, thank you, Lord. If we say we have no sin, again, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. Oh, did yours not say that? All. You know what all means? All means all. That's all all means. That's what it means. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you. That verse gives me hope. These verses here, John is revealing some profound secrets, maintaining this deep and lasting fellowship that he had with Christ. Because everyone has sinned, and John knows it, and most of us know it, he gets right to the point. And he pulls no punches here. I love this. He declares that anyone who says they have no sin is a liar. <laughs> you lie. That's pretty bold. He's saying this to people he doesn't know. He's saying this to believers. Maybe he knows 2,000 years later we will be talking about this at Apex, saying, if you say you don't have sin, you lie. One of two things is true. You're either, <laughs> you're either deceiving yourself, which is, which is not good. You're just revealing your ignorance. Or you're revealing your pride. Neither of which are attractive characteristics, right? Nobody comes up to you, I hope, and says, wow, my goodness, that ignorance looks so good on you today. <laughs> I hope nobody says that to you. And certainly nobody hopefully comes up and says, you know, of all the things I like about you, I think it's your arrogant pride I like the best. <laughs> looks so good. At no, those aren't characteristics we want to emulate as, as followers of Christ. And John is calling them out, and I love his boldness. He is saying here, you can have deep fellowship and the Greek word he uses here is one you have all heard. If you've been in church at all, you know this word. It's koinonia. And it is a beautiful, deep and lasting communion, a friendship, a, a mature nature of friendship that is rare and unseen. It's not fellowship like, hey, let's get together and we'll go to Rudy's and we'll eat some wings and we'll have fellowship. That's not fellowship. There is no serving each other. There is no loving on a deep level. That's fun and that's needed and that's a good thing and I like me some wings. But that's not what koinonia is. It is so deep and it is so powerful. And John is telling his readers, if you want to have deep koinonia fellowship, you're going to have to use the C word. Confession. Well, I don't like that word, Pastor. <laughs> confession implies I got to do something. Confession implies I might have something to confess and that makes us uncomfortable. That means I have to be forgiven for something. Like I've done something wrong. Well, you know what the original word forgive means? It's actually a compound word, and it's beautiful. It says to send away. Check this out. Back before Jesus came, the high priest would literally lay his hands on the, hands, on the head of an animal, usually a goat. And he would say, I identify with the sins, and I will impart them to this animal. And then they will send that animal out into the wilderness symbolically saying our sins for the nation of Israel are being sent away. That's pretty cool. It's the same verb used here. You know what else? It's the same verb when Jesus walked by and just touched someone and the fever left, the fever was sent away. Same word. That's pretty awesome. And it's also the same word that says God has a desire to send our sins away from us. Does that not give you any hope? To know that at the end of our life, when we stand before the Lord, if we have confessed our sin and we have acknowledged him as Savior, Redeemer, Friend, and Lord, and we have invited the Holy Spirit to take up residence in our life, Jesus says, Father, this one's with me. My blood covered those sins. I have washed them. I have thrown them, as the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west. Y'all, that is amazing. I love this. If you weren't here on a Wednesday night, I shared this about four months ago, just this one verse. What is so fascinating to me is notice what the psalmist says, even before Jesus was on the scene. I have taken your transgression and thrown them as far as the east is from the west. You know what's cool about that? You can go around this globe over and over, going west, 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 all the way around, and you will never end up going east. You will never come to a point where, oh, suddenly we're going east. You're always going west. Same thing if you go east. If you go east, you just keep going east. Sun might rise and fall, but you're still going east. But guess what? Notice what God doesn't say. He doesn't say, I will throw your sins as far as the north is from the south. You ready for this? Because if he threw our sins up, we go north, north, north. Eventually, we reach a point where guess what? We start going south. 
we start going closer back to our sins. And if we go far enough south, we come around to a point where eventually we're going north again. He didn't say, I throw your sins as far away as a certain distance, and then I might bring them up later. I might have you come back to them. Or when the devil whispers, you can't be a believer. What are you doing? Don't you know what you, I've known what you do. What? You call yourself a Christian. Who are you fooling? Well, that's what that verse says. When the devil tries to remind you of his past, man, remind the devil of his future. Say, man, you know what's coming? Zip it. I take authority over that. Zip it, lock it, put it in your pocket, right? Isn't that the, isn't that the, the thing we say to the kids these days? You got it. Teachers know exactly what that is. This is, this is so deep. Let's do some old school exegesis. Look at that verse right here. He says, if we confess our sins, notice right away, God's promises apparently are conditional at times. They are conditioned on certain requirements to be met by me and you, by his children. So the first thing we learn right here is that sometimes true forgiveness is conditional. This is so amazing to me. If we confess our sins. A few months ago, you guys may remember, I preached a message from 2 Chronicles 7, where God says, if you do four things, I will do three. It's a beautiful passage. God says, if my people will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, those are the four things, then here's what I will do. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. And you may remember we, we likened it to a computer programmer who immediately recognizes if-then statements. This is the ultimate if-then statement. John is saying in 1 John here, everything hinges on this huge word, if we confess our sins. So immediately, we're confronted with something that we don't necessarily like. This shows us that the forgiveness of our sins is conditional upon the confession of our sins. Now, park it there for a second, because we're going to come back to that. What are you saying, Pastor? Are you saying... If I die with sins unconfessed today, I can't go to heaven? Oh, we're going to answer that. Oh, we're going to dive in. We're going deep. See, what we prefer is this gentle, soft gospel of, can't God just give me a blanket forgiveness and, you know, I'll just stay in and do what I want and cover all indulgences? Well, can he? Oh, <laughs> here's what the original language says. If you look into the Greek, the word confession is a compound word in the New Testament. It comes from a word that means to say and another word that says the same as. So you put them together, it says we are supposed to say the same as God about our sin. Oh, this gets deep. You ready for this? We are supposed to say the same about God. We are literally supposed to agree with him regarding it. God, it is horrible. It is hideous. It caused your death, and I'm so sorry, and I hereby repent of it. Sin isn't some little vice. We like to call it a hang-up. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that's my pet sin. I'm so sorry. Wink, wink. It's my foible, or better yet, we say, it's, <clears throat> I have some shortcomings. That's what politicians love to say, right? Don't call me sinful, just I have some shortcomings. And so do you, don't you judge me, right? First, I love that. I love when we take verses out of context. Right here, this is what makes it so egregious when we willfully sin, because sin is a big deal. It's so big that it necessitated that, the blameless spotless, beautiful flesh of Christ being whipped and beaten and taking our sin in our place. We couldn't do it. Somebody once asked, well, what if we crucified ourselves? Can we crucify the flesh? I'm like, no, because you're not a blameless sacrifice. You tainted. You got problems. So do I. We can't die. We can't earn it. We can't do works. We can't, we, it's nothing we can do like that. This is our way of saying, God, your Holy Spirit has convicted me. That's what he's saying. And we come back and say, I agree with you. I have sinned. And in humility, we come and say, Lord, will you forgive me? Look what John says next in verse 9. That next word, if we confess. So here we learn that forgiveness is confessional. This is so amazing. We just heard that confession is agreeing with God about our sin, right? So let me ask you all a question. Do, Do humans, humans like, like to admit, to admit they're, wrong? they're wrong? Well, let me ask, let me ask, let me ask the ladies. ladies. Women. Women. Why? Why? Do your, your husbands, husbands like, like to, admit to admit when they're wrong? They're wrong. You don't, you don't, don't answer that loud. Oh, goodness. Sorry, Sorry I should have said that first. That first. <laughs> I'll do I'll marriage counseling after church. church. <laughs> no. Goodness, no. no. We don't like we don't to do that. Why? You know why? Because that, that means, that means we, we take ownership of something. Here's what here we, here we do. We're not really sure we want to commit to confessing sin, or we're not really sure we want to commit to owning a sinful behavior. Here's what we do. We camouflage it. 
pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. We camouflage it, right? We say, well, that, I wasn't committing the sin of worry and taking it back out of your hands, Lord. I was concerned. When I blew my top and I lost my cool, I wasn't angry, out of control, God. I was righteously indignant. Don't you love that? It sounds so spiritual. How could that be a bad thing? Oh, God, no, 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 God, 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 that that wasn't lust. That was an admiring glance. For a half hour? Really? You're admiring something because that's more than a fleeting glance. That's not appreciating art. See what we do? We camouflage it. We come along and we think, well, maybe, maybe God doesn't. No, no, no. Confession with God gets real. And it's open. And he sees you. Who are we fooling? The one who breathed into a handful of dirt and it became a man, he knows you. <laughs> he knows us. He knows when we're trying to pull the wool over his eyes. And John comes along and he says, guys, confession gets open and it gets honest. And it is a critical step because there is no lasting fellowship with the king or forgiveness without it. Anyone who's raised kids and has been at the breakfast table and has had the occasion of a giant glass of milk being spilled knows exactly what this goes like. We're all sitting around and boom, the glass gets over and what's the first thing we do? We all jump up, start mopping stuff up and people go, what happened? What happened? Even the one who spilled the milk goes, yeah, what happened? (laughs) How'd that get tipped over? What was that doing in front, right? And thus begins our running from God. We don't want to own it. There is a perfect scene in one of my favorite movies. And here we have Tommy Boy. And Tommy Boy is, oh, you've seen this. I do not endorse any movies from the pulpit, just so you know that. This is one scene, and I'm only talking about this scene. Tommy Boy's filling up his best friend's car with gas. And he's backing up, but the door is open, and it hits that immovable concrete pipe, and it bends the door completely facing forward. So Tommy Boy, because his friend is inside buying a candy bar or something, pulls the car forward, gets out, and starts to immediately push the door back against and sees if he could just, and it shuts. But this time he runs and he gets in the front passenger seat and he sits down and he waits. He's not confessing nothing. And his friend comes out and he's just sitting in his business and he watches his friend and his friend has this happen to him. I love it. (laughs) The entire door falls off in his hand. Now, what is funny about this is not this event. It's the guy's reaction after this. I love it. He looks at him and he says, what'd you do? (laughs) So like us. And thus reveals, even though they didn't mean to, how we like to handle sin. Say, God, that's not... That's not what you think it is. That's not, I don't need to confess that, right? I mean, because I made that right. I, I got over that. Ooh, did we? Because see, when we spill the milk, true confession says, I spilled the milk. I blew that. That's me. I take that. I own that. I agree with you, God, that I did something wrong. And I'm sorry. Not only am I sorry, I'm going to take the step forward into repentance, and I am not only going to disengage from that sin, I am going to walk 180 degrees in the opposite direction to show you I mean I'm sorry. Because it's not just about simply confessing little shallow reciting of misdeeds. That's not what confession is. Confession isn't just going through your laundry list, a litany of sins, saying, oh, this is a misdeed, and I'm sorry, and I did this, and I did that, and I did that. That's, that's right there. That's, that's worth the price of admission. Don't miss this. Confessing is not just a shallow reciting of our misdeeds. There is owning up that comes in confession. You want to restore your fellowship with God? You feel far from him? Who moved? <laughs> not like I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out. Our sin has separated us. It's broken that fellowship. Remember the sun? still so shining. shining. The cloud has just moved between you and the sun. Move, move those clouds. Confess, confess those sins. Sin. That's the good news. Jesus, Jesus has provided a way through that cross. Bury our sin. I'll take it. I'll, I'll take, take it. it. Throw it on me. Cast it on me. I will be the sin bearer for you if you would ask me to. And this is my free gift. And because of that, forgiveness is freely available to all. That is awesome news. But here's what John is saying. It is conditional 
and it is confessional. But there's one other thing that you need to know. The next word in that verse is a huge word. He says, if we confess what? Our sins. Forgiveness is continual. Now, this is something, when I first heard this, I was reading, this is from uh, the Joshua Code. I'm looking with O.S. Hawkins, and I'm like, Dr. Hawkins, I'm not sure you understand the nature of God's forgiveness here. Because this right here throws me off. Because we had our sin forgiven at the cross. I don't understand why forgiveness is continual. And then I dug deep. I want to show you some hidden truth grenades here that you can take with you. You may have never even thought about this. Notice very carefully that verse 9, there is an S on the end of the word sin. It's plural. Forgiveness is continual. This is saying that the issue here is not our sin nature. The issue here is not our sin nature and being saved once upon a time. That is not what God dealt with our sin nature two verses back in verse 7 when it says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And don't miss this. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Singular. One time act. His blood covered it because that verse right there shows that Christ dealt with sin on the cross. Once and for all, breaking those chains of sin over us. This is a huge distinction here, okay? You need to get this. There's a difference between the root and the fruit here. The root of our sinful nature is sin. The fruit of a sinful nature is sins. These are things we do. We may not like it. We may not mean to. We may choose willfully from time to time to do that. And this is where it gets so deep because I want to differentiate something here. John is saying we are to continually confess as we are made aware of our sins to restore our fellowship. That's different than our salvation. So let's differentiate. Let's go deep. We're already there. <laughs> A lot of pastors won't touch this. But I want to dive down on here. Look at this. Some people read these verses and they get confused because they see a plural word in verse 9 and they see a singular word in verse 7 and they say, are you not talking about the same thing? Why are you differentiating that? What if I die and I haven't confessed my sins that day, pastor? What happens? Do I lose my salvation? Is, is suddenly my sin greater than the cross? Is suddenly, even though I believe that God could put me in the palm of his hand and keep me and, and, and maintain me and the same God who could save me is the same God who could keep me saved, suddenly is, whoa, I lost one. What happens? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's the deal, because there's good people who differ on this. There are good theologians, but I want to share with you, from God's word, as best I believe, what most evangelical pastors, myself included, believe these verses say, okay? Hear me very clearly. Our sin was dealt the death blow on the cross. You need to know that. You need to live and walk in that freedom, because there is nothing more bonding and, and putting you in chains, and to lay in bed at night going, I wonder if I was good enough today to keep my salvation. God, did I, do, did I forget something? I did. You know how you can tell? Because when you came to Christ, notice what you didn't have to do. You didn't have to sit down with the world's longest grocery list and confess and go and write out and itemize every sin you've ever done. Isn't that interesting? You know why? Because we couldn't remember half of them anyway. It's not conditional on what we do it's conditional on what God had already done. His blood was sufficient, period. It broke the chains of sin. He beat the devil. He bought us back from sin in the grave, okay? So know that. We, we don't have to sit down and list everything in order to earn it. We can't do that. We didn't clean ourselves up and then come to Christ. It's the other way around. God saved us from our sin, and he broke those chains. In verse 7, it's our sin that he dealt with, past tense, singular, on the cross, giving us relationship with God. This is called justification, freely being removed from the penalty of sin. We are justified. Easy way to remember that, just as if I'd never sinned. It is a beautiful concept. Then we see in verse 9, sins, plural. This is so deep, the present tense. This is what comes into play regarding our ongoing fellowship with God. Don't miss this. By the power of the Holy Spirit living inside us, when we do something wrong, the Holy Spirit convicts us, and we know it, and we are to immediately confess that. This is the ongoing power God gives us to resist and rebuke sinful behavior. You know what that's called? Another fancy word, sanctification. It is a beautiful word. This is what frees us from the power of sin every day. The ongoing process of living a holy life that honors him and hopefully resembles him. How you doing with that? Which brings us to the last one and perhaps the best news of all, glorification. This is the freeing of us from the presence of sin once and for all. 
when Christ comes back or when we go to be with him and we are given new glorified bodies and before he comes back and makes the new heavens and a new earth and he sets all things new, we are finally removed from sin. If it helps, think of it like this. This is a beautiful chart that'll help you. Over here on the left, we have justification. This is when you become a believer. We have been saved and set free from the penalty of sin. From this line to this line is our daily life here on earth. We are being saved every day from the power of sin. That is sanctification. That's why we come. That's why we study the word. That's why we sing songs. That's why we have koinonia fellowship. That's why we come together and we form the bride of Christ, the church. We are being sanctified every day. Then, ho, 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 glorious day, glorification, when we will all be saved from the presence of sin. It will be dealt with. And we read the end of the book. We know how it ends. And it's a beautiful story where the devil and his false prophet and the Antichrist will be thrown into the lake of fire, burning forever and ever. And sin and death and Hades and all of that is gone. And you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to look a box of Krispy Kremes in the eye and say, I rebuke you, devil. <laughs> Just saying. <sighs> For several years, my lovely wife taught piano lessons. And I can't tell you the joy that emanated from some of those students as it wafted up the stairs that is a very open stairway to where I could not hide any farther in my house. Because inevitably, there were some students who would come and they, let's just say it was obvious they did not quite practice very much. Even though they came and they should have known better and they should have had a song prepared, they sit down, here's what happens. They start playing through the song and they get through the first page, awesome, no problem. They get into the second page and guess what happens? Oh man, the wheels come off. It's horrible. It sounds like a train wreck, a frog in a blender or something. I mean, it's horrible. It's one of those things and it is just, one, it's like, what is this? And stop, stop, what is that? And I'll be like, please keep going, please keep going. Guess what they do? This is so deep. They go back to the beginning and they start it again. Only this time, they play it louder and slightly faster because they're agitated. And they play through it, and they're going, oh my, come on, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Please get to it, please get to it. Please get to it. <laughs> Guess what they do? They go back again to the top of the song, and I got to hear it again. Only this time it's even louder and angry. And I'm going to get through this part. And they go through, oh, I'm going somewhere, church. Don't you miss this. <laughs> They get through it. They get all the way up to this part. And bing, 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 and it falls off again. And I'm like, cool, it's maddening. How many times am I going to have to listen to Pop Goes the Weasel and not finish? <laughs> Please finish the song. You ready for your truth grenade? That is exactly how many of us live the Christian life. We start strong. Man, we got that first few bars of the Christian life down by heart. We know it. We've got it. We've, we've started over a thousand times, and man, we know. You know what? I don't need a louder and newer beginning. I've already got that part down. I got the basics of the Christian life memorized by heart. I need to keep going. I need to confess my sins and finish the song. Fellowship with the king. It's a daily walk. Coming together. Uniting. Coming and saying, God, I confess my sin. I want to keep going. True confession leads to true forgiveness, which leads to restored fellowship. Fellowship with the king. It's a beautiful thing. As you grow in your faith and as you strive, as you maybe you're a new believer and you want to take those next steps, Jesus left two things for the church to do consistently till he returns. You know what they were? Lord's Supper and baptism. We're going to do both this week. Within the next seven days, you have a chance to partake in one or both if you need to. This Wednesday, we're going to have a Lord's Supper service. And it is going to be so different, so, so special. Okay? I'm going to be bringing a message that continues this theme of fellowship and how you can feel and know and believe, believe that, you that you are close, close with the Father, that you are as close as you, as you want, want to be. be. And it, it is, is a beautiful, beautiful thing, thing. And, and it is, is going to be powerful, powerful. and it, it always, always is. is. Then, the then the following Sunday, Sunday we're going to have our baptism 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 service. And it is going to be a powerful experience because people are going to testify to the change God has made in their life. Here's just a few of those who have made their faith decision public. Have you done that? I was reading a phenomenal blog by Aaron Davis this week. 
And she's talking about how baptism is sprinkled all throughout Scripture, especially the Gospels and on into Acts, and why it was so important, and why she wrestled for so long not following the believer's baptism. And she showed these incredible reasons, and I love this. She said, the first thing you need to understand, maybe you're watching at home and you're struggling with this and you haven't followed through with that, we need to understand the reasons we should be baptized. We should be baptized first and foremost as a symbol of God's grace. That he has come, that he has saved us. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we repent, we are agreeing that we are sinners before God. That we have violated his commands. We, I need help being holy, God. I can't do it on my own. I can't earn it. Not even baptism saves us. That will work. But it is what he asks us to do, which is what he says next. Baptism shows our loyalty to Christ. It shows that, hey, I'm identifying. This is whose side I'm on. I publicly come out of those waters. Remember what it says? It says, I am buried in the likeness of his death, and I am raised to walk in newness of life. He is my king, and I am loyal to him. And I'm putting the devil on notice. He, he is, is my king. king. I, love I love how John, John Piper put it. He said, faith unites, unites us to Christ. Christ. Baptism, Baptism symbolizes that union for one and all to see. What a powerful thing. thing. You, know, you know, when I got, I got married, married, I got this, got this ring. ring. Thankfully, I've never lost it. Whew, yes. It's an endless circle, and it's made of gold to symbolize two things, the purity of the vows we took and the fact that it's never-ending. You can come and go all day long in this and never find its end. And that's how serious we took the vows. But this ring isn't what made me married. It's a symbol of it. You know what made me married? My covenant vows before God that that would be my wife till death do we part. This ring is just a symbol. It's a powerful symbol, and I wear it proudly every day. But it's not what makes me married. It's just like that with baptism. What a powerful illustration. One of the reasons we should be baptized is because Jesus commanded it. It's a beautiful thing. He comes and he says, remember, these are his last words. He is just getting ready to ascend to be with the Father. Of all the things he could leave with us, guess what he chose to say? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Man, that's pretty powerful right there. Go, make disciples, and baptize them. But probably the most important one, the one that did it for me when I wrestled this for like a decade, you get, you get baptized because Jesus did You do it because he did it. It is a beautiful thing. In Matthew 3, he says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and guess what happened? The heavens were open to him, and the Spirit of God descends like a dove coming on him. We hear this voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Of all the things I want to hear my Savior say one day, it's that. Well done. I am well pleased. How about you? Jesus is baptized. I want to be like Jesus. That's good enough for me. If you haven't been and you want to, would you talk to me after church today? Just come up and see me. We could talk about it. Next week is a beautiful time. We're even going to have the kids in here. We have like 30 little scudders running around in here because it's a fifth Sunday and we don't do children's church. It's going to be awesome. And they get to watch other children being baptized and maybe adults. If God is putting that on your heart and you know who you are and you feel it, he's, he's talking to you, don't put it off. It is an act of obedience that gives you fellowship with the king. So this week as we prepare to take communion on Wednesday night to celebrate the Lord's Supper and the following Sunday as we prepare for the ordinance of baptism, I'm going to give you a challenge to take with you, Okay. Here's your challenge. It's going to sound simple until I explain it. Your challenge this week is to read 1 John 1, verses 5 through 9, every day. Oh, yeah, that's easy, Pastor. I can do it. I can do it. Well, wait, wait. Here's what I want you to do differently. This is not a casual reading of this passage. I want, if you take this challenge, between now and Wednesday, not the rest of your life, you don't have to read this. Between now and Wednesday, to read, read this, this as many times, times as, as you can find the time, time to, to, to meditate on this, to pray about it, to, to, to come, come to the Lord and realize, realize this powerful truth that he made a way for us to live, free, free from our sins, sins free from the guilt and the change that, that sin, sin brings, brings, to restore to that fellowship. fellowship. Read this every day between now and Wednesday when we take the Lord's Supper and thank him that he not only dealt with our sin once and for all, but that he deals with our sins every time we confess them. 
that he that wiped them away and says, what's this? I threw, I threw that, that as far as the east is from the west. When you repent, when you confess to me, I forgive you. And I don't remember it anymore. And as God brings up any issues to your mind during your emotions, here's the hard part. Don't run from them. Don't camouflage them. Don't wink at them. That's the holy thing. If God convicts you, the Holy Spirit touches you, confess it. And watch those clouds separate and watch your fellowship go to new heights. Been feeling far from God lately? There's keys to fellowship right here. Keep that fellowship with the King clear and open. Confess, repent, and daily strive for holiness. Let's pray about it. God, we thank you that we can confess our sins. I thank you that you have thrown our sins as far as the east is from the west, and you have dealt with our sin once and for all on Calvary. And it wasn't partial, and it wasn't just something that we have to earn. I thank you, Lord, that you wrote yourself into the story, and you broke every chain that the enemy had. You are powerful. You are almighty. You are so worthy of worship. God, forgive us for the times that we wink at sin. Forgive us for the times where we do not resemble your church the spotless bride that you want to come back for. God, help us to live more like you, to resemble you, to point others to you this week. That's our prayer together in Jesus' name. Amen.